Hello, my name is Paul Gilbert, and I'm president of the Compassionate Mind Foundation. And this is part of the Creating the Compassionate World series of interviews. And today I'm absolutely delighted to have Joe Tucci with us, all the way from Australia. <laughs> it's, a, it's late in the evening for him. And he invited me to an absolutely extraordinary, incredible conference uh, last year on childhood abuse. He's one of the leading authorities in the world on how we addressed uh, childhood abuse. So I'm just gonna read you a little bit about him now, and then we're going to talk about the importance of his work for how we create a compassionate world, because we have to address the quite serious and endemic issues of childhood abuse and how we can ensure that all children come into the world and are loved and cared for. So Dr. Joe Tucci is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Childhood Foundation and is also the inaugural chairperson of the National Centre for Action on Child Sexual Abuse. Joe is a registered psychologist and social worker with significant experience in child protection and working therapeutically with children. He has worked in the field of child abuse for the past 30 years. He graduated with honors in psychology in 1986 and honors in social work in 1988 from Manhattan University. Joe completed his doctorate in emotional child abuse at Monash University in 2005. He has presented at national and international conferences on family therapy and child abuse. His writings have been published in both Australian and, and international academic journals and the broader media. In 1993, he was awarded a Crestwick Foundation Fellowship in Child and Family Relationships to work with the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children in the United Kingdom. He is an accomplished practitioner researcher with significant experience in child protection and working therapeutically with children and families. He is a clinical member of the Victorian Association of Family Therapists and a member of the Australian Association of Social Workers. His experience includes child protection, family counselling at the at the Nth Melbourne Community Health Centre and child abuse research with the Department of Social Work at Monash University. He has been a guest lecturer in child abuse and family therapy at Monash, La Trobe and Deakin Universities. He is an honorary research fellow with Child Abuse Prevention Research at Australia and again at Monash University. He has acted as a consultant in the Department of Human Services, Victoria, and Department of Health and Human Services, Tasmania, Office of Children and Families on a member uh, on a number of child abuse and child welfare evaluative projects. He has demonstrated experience in developing and implementing child-focused therapeutic programs and child abuse prevention campaigns. He has served on a member of government advisory bodies, including the Australian Council for Child, Children and Parenting, an advisory body to the Commonwealth Government. I think that's an extraordinary set of achievements, Jay. What a wonderful contribution you have made to the, to the area. And um, so today we'd like to pull on your vast experience um, to think about um, the implications of the work that you're doing uh, for the world in general, or how we treat our children. So can I ask you first, so how did you get interested in this area and, and, and link it to things like compassion? What got you into wanting to work in this area? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, I, I was thinking that by the time you read the, the uh, my introduction, that the hour would almost be over. So I'm close to get to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> I got interested because... I think that children are often blamed for what they, the challenges they pose to families and communities rather than um, us understanding why, why they behave in the way that they do. If you, if you think about children who've experienced violence, sexual abuse, family violence, um, they've all, they all have their lives disrupted, shattered. Um, and as a result of that, they, they are on a search for meaning, I think, um, in so many different ways, whether that's somatically, you know, in their body or whether it's um, 
cognitively when they start to be able to make sense of, of some of the, the things that have happened to them. So that search for meaning isn't what adults understand that search for meaning to be. It's not the same kind of processes that we engage in. Um, it's, it's expressed in behaviour. It's expressed in a range of different ways that they react or engage with the world. And, and often for these kids, they carry with them disappointment, shame. They carry with them um, a sense of, of guilt um, that maybe they should have been able to do something themselves to stop it. Um, or um, they carry with them a sense of hopelessness, which turns into rage or turns into anger. And so their, their search for meaning is, is visible to us as a community. We just don't perceive it as meaning. What we perceive it is as um, uh, we see it as children acting out or children challenging the norms or not following the rules or you know, not, not being willing to um, accept an education. And so we often, we often re-traumatise them by blaming them, by making them be responsible for their own behaviour. We see that in Australia in a whole range of ways, which we can talk about. Um, but what these kids are really telling us is that something's happened to them, something really powerful has happened to them, something that they can't make sense of easily and that they, they are left with a set of needs that no one out there can meet and they show it to us in their behaviour. And what they really need from us is a sense of understanding and ultimately, I think, compassion. Ultimately, a sense of being able to be, be seen, their pain be able to be seen and visible and validated, that their, their sense of struggle um, <clears throat> as a result of the pain that they're still enduring needs to be... Um, uh, acknowledged and and as they as if we're able to do that and draw them closer to us individually as well as a community um i think children feel like this that people have got their back there's someone's there for them that they belong to a community that cares and is willing to stand up for them and then we can start to address what's going on so compassion for me is the key you know, instead of blaming and, and making them responsible for what isn't their fault, really, it's not their fault, um, uh, compassion reaches out into their heart and tries to find in them what it is that they, they're still um, sitting there waiting to, to have met, um, the, the hole that's there that, that they're looking for con consistently in the relationships around them. Yeah. That's what yeah. that's what drives them. Yeah. yeah, that that drive to help children find that sense of connectedness, that sense of meaning. Because as you know, we've talked about the fact that as humans, we're basically born to be loved. If we're not, we're in trouble because it affects the way our brains are and so on. And a lot of these children are uh, trying to survive basically and and deal with threats and so on. So what you're saying is absolutely so so important isn't it really about how we can help children get back into the the ways in which their brain were naturally designed for which is to be part of a caring sharing environment but the work that you're doing I mean it's it's pretty taxing I mean you hear some pretty terrible stories so what was what was it that really made you choose to come into this particular area whether well, some other area of child or whatever I mean this is a quite a tough area you have to be quite compassionate within yourself to cope with some of the stories you hear I think it's a good question Paul I think I think for me um part of part of what kind of drives me is a sense of anger and frustration that as a community um, of adults, we tend to lose sight of what children need and we see the world not through their eyes but through our own. And that, you know, I, I, I get angry. I still am angry. You know, I, I get frustrated that governments can't see that, that, that often policies and systems that are designed to help children actually have the reverse effect on them. Um, so 
it, it's probably part of my being Italian, I, I think, that, <laughs> you know, that there's this yeah. kind of sense of, you know, when there's a, it, certainly family is very important to me. And, and in all of our, in all of my stories and in, in my background, um, children and family is really, really important. So I think that's the heart of it. But at the, at the other side is this kind of sense that you can't stand, you can't sit down. You can't wait idly when you see a problem as tough as this. I mean, when we do, just as, a, as an example, what do I mean by the community kind of um, uh, letting children down? We do community attitudes tracking studies. We've been doing it for 18 years. It's one of the kind of longest running um, attitude tracking studies. And we ask the community, a sample of the community adults, um, where would you put child abuse on a list of community concern? And consistently, they put it last. Comes after road, after problems with roads and footpaths, after problems with council rates. Um, and when you remind them, you say, "Well, where would you put child abuse?" You didn't, you know, you might not have even identified it. It goes from last to first. But we have to be reminded as a community to put it. Um, to 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 prioritise it, and I think it's because we find it so confronting that adults who are supposed to be caring for children, who are supposed to be loving them, are actually the ones that end up hurting them. That is such a confronting topic that we put it to our to one side, and we put it um, we we constantly decenter it so that we we're not faced with the reality of the pain that children experience. And we'd rather believe that it happens in someone else's family or someone else's neighbourhood. Um, and that even if it is happening, someone else is doing something about it. So as, as, a, as, a, as an issue and, and therefore directly um, affecting children, because it does, when, as an issue, we, we consistently um, find uh, barriers to action and because we we can't hold on to the truth onto this reality that children are hurt by adults and as a as a species we're very creative in the ways that adults continue to find um, different and, and incredibly effective ways of of hurting children and harming them and exploiting them um, and it and it has a direct impact on them. People see abuse and they don't report it. Um, people, people identify the impact of abuse so they can see the problem in children, but they're not willing to understand the connection between the abuse and the behaviour that children are showing us. And so, you know, for me, the, the fundamental of it is that if we don't change community attitudes, if we don't, if we don't find a way through, and we've tried campaigns and we've tried education, and I don't think that works. I think what will work is trying to connect into people's sense of compassion for these children. And whenever I've written an article for a, new, for a newspaper, say, in, in Australia, I get some quite amazing responses because people, because what I'm doing is not trying to, inform them not trying to cognitively say oh, i you know there's one abuse one report of abuse every two minutes in australia um, what i'm trying to do is is get them to see that these kids are these kids that they're trying to separate themselves from are really all of our children they're, they're, they're exactly your kids in different circumstances or they're your friends children in different circumstances we have a connection to all of the children in our community because of childhood itself. And, and compassion to me is the way that we get there. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I kind of think of it. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can unpack that a little bit, that's a, a number of different things. So one is this passion. And I think it's very important because you're saying that, you know, anger, sometimes compassion is perceived as this quiet, you know, 
be compassionate and by kindness. Blah, blah, blah. That's all very well. But what you're saying is that you need a passion. You need an anger. You need to get up and say, stop, stop. This mustn't happen. Let's stop this from happening. And that's a very important the issue of the prevention of harm. I think it's a fundamental issue in compassion. So you, so you, you, you put that brilliantly. The other issue, I think, which is very interesting, is that you say that there is a sort of an ignoring or a clouding over or a slightly denial or dissociating from the reality. And I think this is interesting because, you know, if we look back over hundreds or thousands of years, children had a really bad deal. I mean, after the hunter-gatherer societies collapsed with the advent of agriculture, we all got wealthy and had all the empires and everything. Children have done terrible. They've been slaves, they've been put down mines, they've been used as sex workers and so on and so on. So only in the last hundred years, we started to realize, hang on a minute, you know, maybe we shouldn't put our kids in the factories at eight years old. And maybe we should, you know, and actually starting to realize that, you know, that they actually need to be treasured. They need to be cared for. And all of the stuff that you're talking about is so important because if they're not, then they literally have brain damage. And if there was anything physical, that cause brain damage in the way that abuse does, we would stop it overnight, right? We yeah. discovered the lead in the petrol damaged kids' brains, so we took it out. But this is the most important, the most important process that damages kids. And yet, as you say, we kind of put it on the back burner. So I think what you're doing is absolutely extraordinary, brilliant. So you're saying that one of the things you have to do is not just to educate people, but sort of raise compassion. So how do you do that? How do you raise compassion for these kids that are being emotionally and physically damaged? It, it's it's very hard. It's very hard to do that. Um, I, I think that as an organisation, the foundation tries to... to um, but actually, if I say it this way, you know, over the last 30 years, what the foundation's done is um, gone from shock and, and war campaigns, you know, these, these really dreadful, painful, horrific type of campaign where you see a child being hurt and then you, you, you have to respond to that um, or, or trying to, to unpack the dynamics of abuse in different sorts of ways. Um, and we've moved to a more, I think, what, what we found along the way was that people just switch off from that. People switch off from that sort of sense of, of um, having abuse put into your face and you have to, you have to respond. It, it's not that kind of issue that, that people um, find it easy to engage with as we've talked about so we've moved to a, to a softer spot and the softer spot is a is a place where we communicate that um, children have needs and children have rights um, that the responsibilities for the expression of those rights are actually with adults not with children Children can't express their own rights. I mean, they can as they get older, but they've got to get to 15, 14, 15, 16 to be able to have the capacity really to express the, the rights that we, we've given them or that they hold. Um, so we, we talk about the rights, we talk about adults' responsibilities, and we talk about needs. More often than not, we're talking about needs because I think everyone can connect in with what children need from parents, what children need from a community. And they need the sorts of things that you just said. They need love, they need relationships, they need a, a sense of belonging, they need their culture to be respected, they need their, their developmental vulnerability to be acknowledged and respected. So they're the kinds of messages that you that we're, we're starting to put out more and more. And as we do that, it's like an invitation to the community to say there's a job to do here. And you can either ignore it or you can join us in, in actually enacting it. And that enacting isn't necessarily only when the abuse and the violence occurs. It's actually way, way before that. It's about how do you celebrate childhood 
how do you how do you um, make children or help children to feel important and be important in your life? Um, what is it that that you can do as a as an individual and as a group and as a community that that um, doesn't leave any child outside of a circle? It leaves them on their own. Leaves them feeling like they they're not part of. Um, a, a group or part of a community, and and um, when you do that, you do you do see people engaging more with that. And what they what I think I see in the people that start to come and respond positively to that invitation is a is a shared sense that what they um, that they're here for a higher purpose, and that higher purpose is ultimately the protection of children but they find themselves being able to do one small thing one small thing which is you know during during COVID during the lockdowns and you know Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world and um, we had we had houses putting up teddy bears out the front window so that children, when they went for a walk in their local community, had something of interest more than, than um, they would otherwise have had. So there was a TV here or a TV there or, or you know, or, um, other kinds of dolls up in the windows. And, and kids would leave little messages written in chalk on the, on the, um, on the footpath for the, pe the people who put these little dolls up in the, in the Windows saying thank you. Um, we really loved. I really loved your your teddy bear. Those sorts of things like that. That just did that. That had the effect, I think, of for the first time being able to see that a community can come together around children, can come together and deliver, you know, something that's a that's a message that's this this, this beautiful, caring, tender message to children, and. And in the process, I think the whole community was enriched. The whole community felt like, oh, we've done something great for kids. Um, and, and I think that to me is, a, is kind of a shared experience of compassion. You, you, you're doing something for somebody without necessarily appreciating or expecting a, a return. You just you you're investing in your community. You're investing in children, and and we saw these little pop ups happen over in all sorts of different areas. You know, we had spoons built. We had wooden spoons being um, uh, decorated with with faces and being planted in in little um, sort of little community gardens or on the sidewalk. Um, where so children could come and they would plant their own or they'd go and play there. And so COVID was this incredible time, I think, whilst it had all sorts of devastating impacts for sure. But one of the things that it did was that it could it harness the collective effort around children. Now I I I would I'm hoping that those lessons we don't forget and we carry with them, carry it with us into actually doing something when children, when childhood itself has been threatened by abuse and violence to the, to the, you know, to the extent and degree that it's happening now, that the community will want to do the same thing. And it, because it's the, it's the same, it's, it's exactly the same principle um, to, to look out for children, to celebrate children, to, to know that, that, your kids, the kids that you know about, the kids that are part of your family or your friends, they're as important to you as children that you don't know and that you need to do something about for them as well. So I, I hope that that's the sort of messaging that we're putting out to engage the community in that sort of invitation. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, in terms of compassion science and application, what you're saying is that you know, there are two very different processes here, preventing the bad and and facilitating the good, cultivating the good, you know, as it were. And that actually 
your brain will respond quite differently if you're trying to stop something than if you're trying to create something good because when you create something good you get positive feelings i suppose the problem that people might ask you but yes that's good but are you not just preaching to the converted i mean are you not just working with families who are already going to be like that so they will naturally paint pictures and so forth because as we know tragically abuse actually increased during um, lockdowns um so it's again how do you take that creating the good so that it will have an impact on this uh endemic of, of of abuse can you see that happening yeah well first so the, the the creating the good was pitched at a community level not at an individual family level where where there's risks and vulnerabilities it's pitched at a community level well what you're trying to do is what we're trying to do is reshape or shape community attitudes so that if there's a family in need we don't leave them to their own devices we step in as a neighbor or we step in as a as a interested community member and we offer some level of support knowing that that might help the children in that family we've, we've got to have some of that goal some of that orientation in our mind but at an individual family level i mean once the abuse occurs there's a there is a significant shift that you have to make in relation to understanding what children need um, and how you work with parents to to firstly it depends on what i mean you know when we talk about child abuse we're, we're really conflating a whole range of different experiences where child sexual abuse is very different to physical abuse and it's very different to family violence so it, it's hard to generalize but you know if, if we talk about if we talk about family violence for a minute family and domestic violence what what we know is that the the impact the dynamics within that family needs to be restructured they need to have where there's where there's um coercive power where there's where there's the misuse of power um, then those those dynamics need to change one of the ways that we found that adults especially men who are used violence um, can start the process of of accepting responsibility for what they've done and ch making changes to their behavior is to help them to spend time thinking about the impact of their of their attitudes not just their behavior because their behavior is like the end road of what they've been thinking about for a long time so it's it's about the dynamics that they establish and their thinking and their attitudes which become pervasive in a family is to talk about the impact on children and to see that they, their kids are missing out on a relationship with them which they generally still would like to have um, and so we 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 in a kind of a psychoeducative way can work with with men who are using violence where children are, are involved where children are the subject of that violence and being victimized we we can um, start to specifically relate what children have experienced so that they those adults that adult male can start to you know have the option of thinking about their behavior in a different kind of way knowing that your child has gone from um, uh, knowing that your child now reacts to the world as if threat is always around them not just when you're there but always shifts can shift the way that men who use violence um, think and and then behave subsequently but it's not an overnight process but that's the kind of messaging that's the kind of intervention that we offer when we're working where the, the abuse and the violence has occurred already yeah, that's a, that's amazing, isn't it? That's incredible. We, we, I, I think you've talked to Charlie, haven't you? Because we have a big program in some of our social services of using compassion in, in the families that are struggling. And one of the key things we 
focus very much on it's not your fault. You know, you didn't design your brain to be like this, blah, blah, blah. And if you can reduce shame because you get into this, people then feel bad about what they've done, but then they're feeling bad about what they've done. It just makes them feel bad, so they're going to do it again. So reducing the shame of what's going on. So this is actually not your fault, but it is your responsibility to understand what those feelings are about and to regulate your behavior, blah, blah, blah. So that does seem to be quite important when people in these positions, in these families feel de-shamed, that does create a much easier um, ground for producing compassion. So when they're not ashamed of what they are or think people are looking down on them or they're just a violent nobody or whatever it is, that seems to be such an important. So the key, I think you're pointing out, which is very, very important, is that when you're working with people who have got caught up in this, we have to have compassion for them as well. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and it's how we actually not don't shame them, but help them understand the nature of their mind. That they didn't choose to be born to have a brain like that, but that those sides of them, that dark side is now in control. But they, if they learn to pay attention, they learn to notice, they have ways of being different. So I think that's, again, because I know you do that sort of stuff as well, having compassion and bringing compassion to people who actually are being abusive can be very, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Paul. And even, and, you know, I think what we, what we also find is that we, we have to um, uh, help the systems, the networks of relationships around children to um, uh, build compassion for them. Because, you know, when you've got one of these kids who won't sit still, whose, whose attention is, is shot, they're, Attentional capacity is gone because the threat danger system is, is alert all the time. Um, they're not very good students and they're not very easy to manage in a classroom. Um, and teachers, you know, teachers go into it with a whole range of really positive intentions, but they can still be um, overtaken by the behavioural challenges of these children who've experienced this incredible violation and abuse over, over the course of their life to that point. And as you said, are only really surviving. They're, they're only doing what they've been programmed to do. There's, they have no choice other than what they're doing right now. Um, and for us, helping teachers and, and football coaches and other, other adults who are important in the lives of these kids to develop a, com a sense of compassion for their experience, for what's happened to them, means that they won't, they're less likely to at least, less likely to engage in, in actions where the slightest bit of disapproval can lead to shame for these children. Um, these children have shame triggers that are very, very easy to activate. And, and so how do we avoid them going into that shame response? Because to them, the, the experience of shame is as, is as powerful as is the experience of the threat in the first place. Yeah. And their brain and bodies react in a way that is the same for both. They, they don't have a, a host, a myriad of, of strategies to be able to deal with it. They've only got three or four if they're lucky and it's the same response to shame as it is to threat and danger. And so helping, helping, the, helping adults to kind of know how children are experiencing what their needs are that's driving the behaviour and to feel compassion for what that, how that need has been left unattended, that can in, that can really make a difference in the life of that child. I think that's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing of actually helping people recognize that you know the child that's acting out and is, and so on is not being naughty or bad and needs needs putting them in their place but actually they're operating very deep brain systems of survival really and if you threaten a child 
uh, then once you get the threat system going, if they don't have any other regulators, that's what they'll... So bringing all that wisdom into schools, into parenting uh, is terrific. And uh, again, I say what you're doing is just to... Because that's a new, you know, that, that hasn't been there you know, previously to bring this knowledge to schools, to bring this knowledge to parents. Because um, it, it, comparison is all very well, uh, but it's when you hit the fan, you know, That's right. That's <laughs> it, when right. it gets tough, you know, when it's when it's really testing you, your your anger yourself is going, your frustration yourself is going. Can you use compassion then? Because if it's a fair weather friend, then it's no good to anyone, really, is it? So this bringing compassion to the difficulties, to the dark side, to the real stuff that's hurting and causing lots of challenge, that's where it does its work. So, you know, what you're saying, I think, is absolutely extraordinary. So what? If, move on a little bit. What do you see as the challenges to this extraordinary work you're doing? Well, I think the challenges are that as I said before, I think one of the major challenges is that we don't, as a community, we're still not opening our eyes to the extent to which child abuse and family violence occurs. Um, and when you, when you close yourself down to that reality, it's very hard to um, not see children as, as like you were saying, naughty or challenging. It's very hard to not, um, to, to go beyond what children's behaviour is and see the need behind that that's driving that behaviour in the first place. So it's a, it's a really big challenge to keep society open to the idea, to the truth really, that children are being hurt. And that this isn't something that only that happens historically, as you know, Australia had a royal commission, a huge investigation into institutional child sexual abuse, where churches and, and all sorts of groups, organised institutions, had individuals within them that sexually abused children, and then those institutions themselves. Um, move those people around or they were more loyal to the individual than they were to, to doing something about children, covered it up in a whole range of ways. And so, you know, almost as a default, we now seem to think that that happened in the past. That's another, that's another kind of challenge that we've, we've introduced uh -huh. by the very fact of what we've been trying to do, bring it out into the light. We're now saying, well, that happened 50 and 60 years ago. It's not happening now. Well, it is. And if you don't, if you don't, I think compassion is based on, for me, you know, compassion has, has, has to start from an openness. It has to start from an openness to the belief that there are, that there are experiences out there that are different to your own. There are experiences out there that might be similar to your own as well, but um, that 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 openness to other people's pain will bring change. The biggest challenge we've got is that society continually, or in my mind at least, continually tries to close that down because it's it's too hard to stay open to it. Um, you know, we're seeing in the UK is the same. We know this and all around the world. We're seeing, you know, this incredible spike, this incredible increase in the in the in the um, exploitation of children online um, by by adults who are um, hiding in plain sight, hiding as you know, they're hiding as fourteen-year-olds rather than being thirty-four-year-olds and, and engaging children in in the places where they're playing games, and as soon as they can, move them after they've developed some kind of connection, contact, move them offline into another environment, and then begin to groom them in that kind of way. Now, we as a community, we as adults, don't really want to want to know that the internet is a place that has so many risks to children um, because 
we also depend on that very technology ourselves, but we, we depend on it um, to keep children entertained and, you know, quiet whilst adults are doing other things. The reality of the experience of children is that their need for a relationship is always present. It's, for, it's always. I mean, so is ours. Of course, ours is. But children's even more. They, they rely and depend on it. And so I don't know, I don't know how to keep us open to the ideas that children's lives and their worlds are, are, are not dangerous because that's not what we what we're wanting to to believe at all. And it's not the truth. But there are dangers in that world. And the openness to the fact that those dangers can lead to pain needs for us to hold that we need to hold that up that as a as a belief and a, and a, and a real you know in a tangible way uh, and i don't think we we try to do that well i don't know that we do that well as a community no it's interesting isn't it and we're not very good at taking on all kinds of things like climate change you know people are still in denial about it We've got issues of childhood obesity. People are still in denial about it. The foods that we sell our kids, the ways we advertise, the, all that stuff, we're still in denial. The television we allow them to watch, the, the, the violent video games. I mean, all around, actually, they're really the children's minds are really being seriously, seriously challenged. I was There was a wonderful conference in Brisbane a couple of years ago on play, and a real concern that uh, partly through COVID, obviously, but also through online stuff, children are not playing like they used to. You know, when I was young, I used to go out in the streets and kick a ball around and we'd have inter actual interactions. Well, that's not happening quite so much these days. So huge areas where really our children, I think, are suffering because they're not able to live in the environments in which they were adapted to live in. Uh, so, uh, again, I think the work that you're doing is this need to flag up all of these, you can call them dangers or whatever, you, whatever would be useful, but actually they're just really quite serious issues about how we are raising our children in the West. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's not good. Uh, there's some wonderful things like, you know, child, you know, we've got hospitals and all that stuff, or child illnesses, but the psychology of, of child raising at the moment and it needs a lot to be desired yeah yeah that's right Paul. and and we don't we we create the conditions in which children do experience pain and trauma and yet not necessarily see ourselves as creating the resolutions for that pain yeah. and trauma I mean, you know, the, the increasing rates of suicidality in adolescence and depression and anxiety, they're all going up. It's not just COVID that's generated. It is actually, we're not living, we're not creating environments where people feel safe, they feel connected, they can have uh, joyful connections, they feel they can make a contribution. But, I mean, there are so many areas where really children are sort of almost sidelined <laughs> in, in yeah. how we live as a society. Everything has to be on, you know, capitalism and all that stuff. So, so th I think the point that I'm making round and about is this work that you're doing is focusing on how we build communities to pay attention to what children need, and you can do that in a in, in the way that you're doing, but you can also broaden it up. It's absolutely fundamental to creating the worlds we want to live in. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you. I, I, it is a it's a kind of a an ongoing. Um, effort you can't you, there's no you can't stop <laughs> you know it's 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 sort of a relentlessness about it because um or because that's what that's what children deserve what you said is what children deserve they deserve better relationships than what we're offering them they deserve less cluttered lives that have um, these kind of really important, these critical challenges that we're creating for adults are creating, you know, as almost as as um, as play or as as activities that benefit us without any con um, consideration for the impact that it has on children. Um, you know, we we work with children and young people who have engaged in harmful sexual behaviour with other children. 
and you, you that's a group that's a cohort of the community where the the first reaction by everyone is to blame the kids for what they've done and you know sometimes it's it's well often it's very serious what they've done but the, the reality is those kids didn't start off life with that intention in mind. Um, we've created a multi-billion dollar industry of pornography that may or may not be beneficial or, I don't know, entertaining for adults. I don't, I'm not passing judgment on it. It's certainly, it can be exploitative and abusive of a whole range of people, for sure. But it's a multi-billion dollar um, enterprise and children can access it inadvertently by putting the word love into Google and waiting for four or five, um, you know, going down four or five um, of the results and you'll find a porn site. And once children see that, how, yeah, that. once children see that, how are they going to, how do they start to make sense of it? Absolutely. That's, some, that's explanation. Yeah, for some kids they can't make sense of it, so they enact it. They, 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 you know, they, and especially if they've got other vulnerabilities. So, you know, the re this is the reality. Adults have created a, an accessible pornography industry that makes it available to anyone. That anyone also includes children, but we aren't doing anything about how to reduce the impact that it can have on children. And it has real effects in the lives of children. They enact it, they, their behavior changes as a result of it. And then the, then the cycle is that we then blame them for problems that we've created. Yeah. What most kids need is a real sense of compassion, a real yeah. sense of we're here to understand how you've got to this place. Yeah. And there's no way that that's what you wanted to do it has done it, so we need to change it, but we need to understand how it's affected you as well. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's such terrifically important. I mean, you know, some of our concerns is that, you know, Western society with its games and television is overdriving the dopamine system. And uh, that's causing all kinds of problems in terms of, you know, later on what people need, they get bored very easily because they've just been grossly overstimulated. Hunter-gatherer society is you had a lot more quiet, a lot more time in nature, just doing things, you know, where brain's not really designed to be racing, racing, racing all the time. And trying to think about the environments we need to create to raise children such that their brains can work in the way that they're designed to work. I think it's really at the root of a, of a lot of what you're saying. So coming towards the end now, so how do you see your, you know, what are you aiming for in the future? What's your your passion to, to move forward with? Well, we, it's really interesting that part of the Royal Commission um, that we had that we've just been talking about, one of its recommendations was the establishment of a national centre for action on child sexual abuse, which we've now established. Um, and one of the key goals of that is to introduce um, knowledge about compassion into the oh, practitioner That's wonderful. field. Yeah, now I'll come back and talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, and and the, the reason is that we've identified that is because it's as relevant to children as it is, as it is to um, un helping an aged care worker who's now looking after an elderly resident in an aged care home who may, for the first time, feel able and willing and wanting to talk about something, her abuse or his abuse, when it occurred during childhood. And how does that aged care worker who's developed this lovely, loving, caring relationship with this aged care resident know how to respond? Yeah. And, and so compassion becomes a really important resource, I think, for, for victims and survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, over their life course, if we can get it more into the minds of practitioners, um, that their first response and their ongoing response is comes from a place of compassion, comes from a place of understanding, um, and that will change 
you know, you don't have to, we don't have to do something. We have to listen and validate. We have to, you know, they're the sorts of skills that come with compassion. So I'm looking forward to that. You know, it's very rare that I get to write a five-year plan for, a, you know, a semi-government body that has the word <laughs> compassion in it. And there it is. It's there. That's true. That's true. And, that's terrific that's terrific and um finally then if people want to get more involved or hear more about the work that you do um how could they do that well they can go to our website childhood.org.au and they can have a look at all of our all of Fantastic our work. Website. wonderful website yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah and and also you know we have a conference every couple of years which you came to last year um paul and it's you know if people are really interested it's a wonderful opportunity to come to australia Hear some of the best speakers in the world, including yourself, um, and and uh, you know get to see some of the country as well. Well, look, I think you've done a, you, you've done a remarkable job for us. Really, you've talked about compassion in so many ways. There's a passion. You can start from a position of anger. You need to bring in communities. The way you bring in communities is to not just focus on the prevention of the bad, but actually also how to create the good. The importance of thinking about the cultures and the atmosphere that we create to bring up our children. And we're all, we all have a vested interest in doing that. I mean, you, you've really covered an awful lot about, you know, the, the keys to bringing in a compassionate world. And it's not just about let's be soft, let's be kind. It's a, you, you have a real passion and we're very grateful and for all the wonderful work you do, Joe. And uh, I was very privileged to come to Australia last year. I thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a lot. So can I just thank you once again for taking your time to talk to us today and to wish you well in your endeavours. And as I say to people listening to this, do go and look at the website. It's a fantastic website and find out about the work that the, the organisation is doing. So for now, uh, we'll say goodbye to you, Joe. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paul.